Well, relax. We are almost done now with Judith and Holofernes. In my first uh, set of PowerPoints, I talked about the artist's personal vision, how an individual artist might interpret this particular bloodthirsty story. In my second lecture, I talked about context, uh, how artists depicted the story of Judith and Holofernes, depending in part on what was happening in their own time. Today, I'm going to introduce a few elements of what art historians call formal analysis. In other words, looking at the techniques that the artists use to capture our attention, to direct our eye, and to convey meaning. This is a tiny introduction to concepts that we will explore in much more detail, and I am just scratching the surface of formal analysis. But since this introductory unit is meant to give you a taste of what's to come, let's begin. Where are we standing in this picture? This is the question about point of view or focal point. Now, I would say that we are standing right in front of the events, but more significantly, we are close up. Think of what happens when you take a picture with your camera phone. When you want to get your, your friend's faces, you get in close. When you want to get the whole football, a game you move back. In this case, the fact that the picture is cropped, that we're not seeing much beyond the immediate action, shows us that this is meant to be an intimate scene. By contrast, this depiction of the battle between uh, the forces of Assyria and the forces of Israel, by the way, a battle that did not actually take place in the biblical account. We have the panoramic view. We've stepped back in our point of view. Our focal point, I would argue, in this painting is the river that bisects the two armies. Uh, it's a very balanced, symmetrical painting. By contrast, I'm going to go back for a moment. Uh, this is a more unbalanced, less symmetrical painting. Uh, and the focal point in this one, I would say, you might think it would be the head, uh, where you know, which is the center of attention, but in fact, the head is in shadow. I would argue that the place that our eye is drawn in this painting is in the tangle of arms that is caught by the light. So again, to look at the contrast between these two, the small picture, the intimate picture, and then the big picture. The next subject I want to touch on very briefly is line. This is a woodcut of Judith and Holofernes dating from a period very similar to that of the uh, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse Durer woodcut that you saw. Now, a woodcut by nature is going to emphasize line. We'll talk later about how these are made, but essentially the, it is a print. The picture is carved into wood and then stamped, which creates strong lines. But notice all the things that the artist manages to accomplish with line. You have the soft curved lines of the woman's body, the harsh geometric line of the sword. You have cross hatching, crossed small lines uh, in the upper part of her bodice below her kerchief, which designates shadow. In other words, gives the painting some sense of shape. You have the line used to convey uh, folds in the cloth. This is a very sophisticated and interesting use of a rather crude device of producing art. What do you see in terms of lines and shapes in this painting? Uh, this, you will recall, is the kind of cubist rendition of the Artemisia Gentileschi. Well, you see, again, the curved arms of the women, the natural shapes. In nature, we have more curved than straight lines and more irregular than regular shapes. On the other hand, in contrast to these curved lines, and by the way, note that the lines are not defined the way, are, the way they are with the woodcut, but are essentially made with color. What do you see in the background? I didn't notice this the first time I looked at this painting. Um, but in the original, of course, you have just a stark, dark background, whereas the painter here has chosen to contrast the curved lines and shapes with geometric, rather harsh and regular uh, squares. Is this a contrast between the harsh act of killing Holofernes and the soft nature of the women? I don't know, but it's definitely, the artist chose to do that. That was not an accident. This painting also makes it easier to see how artists managed to convey shape, three dimensions that is, in a 
a two-dimensional painting. Notice the, the overlap. One arm uh, is over another, depicting place in space, even though, again, this is a flat picture. Notice the use of shading, uh, which shows that the light is hitting these bodies uh, in different places and therefore, again, indicates that they're three-dimensional. But here's a question for you. What lines are missing? There are no lines in the face. The artist has for his or her own reasons, and I actually don't remember if it's a male or female artist, chosen not to depict the faces. Does that mean that they have lost their personality or that these are generic women? We don't know, but it's clearly an effort on some part by the artist to convey meaning. My next topic is color. Again, we're moving very quickly through subjects that we will address in great detail. We'll come back to color theory uh, in considerable length, for example, when we look at the Impressionists in the 19th century. But let me run quickly through three paintings of this scene and then get back to color in theory. I don't want to spend a lot of time again, we'll return to this, but you should all be familiar with the color wheel. Just a few things to note, center colors, blue, red, yellow are of course the primary colors. Combined, they make the secondary colors. You see the green, the indigo, the orange, and then finally the tertiary colors. Just a couple of other things to note about the color line. Colors that are next to each other on that tertiary color line, say yellow, orange, darker orange, are analogous colors. When they're put together, uh, they blend into each other. They give a kind of continuity, a smoothness, even a calming effect. By contrast, colors that are opposite each other in that secondary color wheel, think of red and green or blue and orange, uh, they are, they're considered to be attractive together. Design theorists think that these colors, uh, and it has to do with the various ways in which they absorb and reflect light. We'll get to that. But they're also used to set up contrast, to draw our attention to distinction between two figures. These other terms, let me go through quickly. Hue is simply the name of a color. So red and pink are both the hue of red, but they have different values. Value refers to lightness or darkness. Uh, you know, a, a deep, dark burgundy has a different value than a scarlet red, which has a different value than a pink. It's easy to confuse this with intensity or saturation, but that actually has to do with whether the colors are bright or dull. And this will be easier to see when we uh, look at these paintings again. And finally, and this is a concept you should begin to get your uh, wrap your head around because it's going to show up in our very next unit on the ancient Near East. All art reflects a decision to portray the subject either descriptively, that is, describing the way it looks in nature, or symbolically, representationally, there are all sorts of different terms that can be used, but essentially where artistic techniques are used to convey meaning by showing the subject in a way that it would not appear in nature. So let's go back to our paintings quickly. Um, first of all, you should see the the complementary colors, those red and green, scream at each other. Uh, they set up a contrast between these two pots. Notice also uh, that there is a very uh, strong, strong brightness, strong saturation. So high values, high saturation. Uh, and finally, notice that this artist combines a symbolic and descriptive use of color. Campbell's soup cans are that red, uh, but I would doubt very much if uh, Holofernes had hair that color or was wearing shades of that particularly violent shade of green. Notice that in this painting, which of course we've seen before, um, we, we see contrasting colors, the blue and the orange, which again draws our attention to these two figures and also to the separation between them. This is interesting uh, because the colors are much lighter, but the Saturation remains high. In other words, these colors are still quite bright. By contrast, Goya's French Revolutionary Woman, uh, the, the, you know, these are quite bright in the sense that that's a strong black and a strong yellow, and yet uh, the colors are dulled. 
And that that reflects the mood of the painting. This is an author, this is, excuse me, an artist painting toward the end of his career uh, when he sees his world coming to an end. The Napoleonic Wars have wreaked devastation, and he is capturing that with these dull colors that convey a depressed and somber mood. I'm just throwing this in because I think this is a very fascinating and, and mysterious use of color. What do you notice above all else? To my mind, it's that Judith and Holofernes have been leached of color. They are essentially in black and white, uh, with two interesting exceptions, which are, and I'm not even talking about the background colors now, well, there's all the blood. Her hands, her knife, his head have bright red blood. And there's one other little color note. She has a tricolor pin. That's the symbol of the French Revolution. So Judith, this is another revolutionary Judith. But in performing this act, has she lost all her own color and conveyed it to the world around her? Is that what those brilliant lines and colors mean? I don't know, but it's interesting to think about. Okay, my last subject, we're almost done with this, uh, is volume and mass. I'm beginning to introduce some of the concepts that we'll see in sculpture. Again, this is a, a marble a statue of Holofernes' head. Uh, it has volume, that is, it exists in the round. You could walk around this piece. Uh, its mass is considerable. Volume, of course, is the space it takes up in three dimensions, and mass is basically its weight. This is a heavy piece. It's carved out of marble, which, as you recall, makes it a subtractive sculpture. Notice that this frieze uh, carved of alabaster, again of Judith and Holofernes, has considerably less uh, volume and mass. In particular, it's not meant to be seen from all sides, only from the front, and its volume only comes out to us in one direction. Ah, and here you see a wire sculpture of Judith and Holofernes uh, with very little mass. Some volume, you can see there's a circular figure here. Uh, this also brings me into my very last topic, which is medium. Most of what we've seen has, so far have been paintings, and most of those paintings have been oil, although I believe we have some tempera paintings in there as well, and of course the woodcuts, which is a printmaking medium. Here we see what happens increasingly in more modern art, which is a use of a multitude of materials. This personally is my favorite. This is Judith as a praying mantis. And by that, I mean that this sculpture employs an actual praying mantis. It's a very small diorama. You can see parts of the praying mantis sticking its legs out. The praying mantis is famous uh, for the female uh, biting off the head of the male uh, at the height of sexual passion. I would recommend staying away from praying mantises. Uh, again, a mixing medium. And as my final example in my last slide in Unit 1, this is a digital photograph of the beheading uh, of Holofernes by Judith. Obviously, this is using the kind of uh, computer-aided graphics that show up in your favorite horror flicks. In our next unit, we are on to Sumeria.